Hey guys, this is Glitler for GrinderSchool.com. This is going to be the first video uh, of a video series. Uh, breaking up, uh, sit and goes into uh, different levels. I'm going to do early, middle game, and end game. And the early game is going to consist of 1020 through 2550. Middle game is going to be 5100 through 100, 225 Annie. And then the end game is obviously 200, 400, and up. All right. Um, and the categories for this one uh, for the early game. We're going to be talking about opening ranges, um, and we're going to get those down for you because we should be pretty tight early, and it's pretty easy to learn what you should be opening uh, early on. We're going to talk about over pairs uh, with like three bets and stuff, ace king, ace queen, continuation bets, how to play top pair, top kicker, set hunting, uh, playing top pair, weak kicker, uh, some very common mistakes that are easy to fix, and uh, finally, we're going to dive into the 25-50 blind level. All right, so. Um, to start off, I'm gonna go over uh, opening ranges, and we're gonna we're gonna keep it pretty easy here. Um, when I'm under the gun uh, early on, the worst hand I'm raising is uh, pocket tens, probably. Um, sometimes I'll limp, um, and you have to excuse me. I messed up when I was putting the hand histories together; they're all out of order. So I'm gonna be jumping around because I'm a noob at the uh, universal replayer. All right, but anyway. Uh, and I'll pull this in so I can jot this down for you. Um, at the 1020 level, and the 1530 is pretty similar, uh, but at 1020, I'm going to be opening Jack Jack and uh, Ace Queen under the gun. Um, sometimes you can open 1010 as well. Sometimes I'll limp. Um, and sometimes I even open them up just like Ace Queen offsuit. Um, I say sometimes I do that, not always. And I've seen a lot of good players limp ace-queen, so that's definitely an option too. I just don't do it because I find that it's easier to play if I raise, but I've seen some great players do it. So obviously if they're doing it, it's a respectable play. Um, and then usually um, in early position, uh, I'm going to be pretty much just playing the same hands as under the gun. Maybe open up. Maybe from here I might open up nines. It's just going to open up a, a, a little bit. But in early position, I'm going to be pretty tight. And for limping, I'm going to limp every pocket pair. Um, and usually people, like you might find people who say, well, limping with twos is stupid because it's a weak hand. And like you're supposed to open for a raise if you come in for a pot. Um, and you should be opening for a raise normally uh, in sit and goes. But at the 1020 and the 1530 blind level, it is perfectly acceptable to limp small pocket pairs. And you will find that pretty much the bulk majority of all winning players are set mining in the first two blind levels. Um, so limp uh, twos through nines, I guess, if we're raising tens. Or if you're raising jacks it up, you would limp uh, twos through tens. Um, and as I, as I move across the table, like when I get into uh, middle position right here, I might open up my range a little bit. It might turn into raising pocket nines and ace jack in middle position now again i just want to give like a little reminder that um these are just uh kind of estimates of what is correct but since it's so early and we're so tight even if these estimates aren't exactly what someone's raising range is for every winning player it's going to be pretty close um so in middle position I'm sorry for my obvious uh donk organization skills doing the powerpoint as i discuss it uh, so middle position would be like nines and ace jack. Um, you might see some people raise maybe pocket eights. You might see them raise ace ten suited. Um, but usually like nines and ace jack, I'm probably going to raise there. Um, and as I get into late position, um, the cutoff, uh, one seat before the button, is probably when I'm going to start to open up a little bit. Um, but again, since it's 10-20, uh, I'm not going to open up too much. So we'll go uh, CO for the cutoff. Maybe something like pocket sevens, and personally, I still do ace jack, but even something like ace ten suited is fine if you're going to come in for a raise there. And then uh, on the button, uh, I might open pocket sixes, um, maybe something like ace nine suited if I was going to raise uh, kind of loose there. A lot of times, I just find myself folding ace nine suited from the button, but it's perfectly fine to raise. You could even raise ace eight suited if you want. This is where you'll find some deviation in uh, some players' raising ranges early on because some 
remain very tight because it's a 10 20 blind level and some feel that they should open up a bit just because since they're in light position there's such a high probability that they're going uh going to one have the best hand pre-flop and and take down the blinds with uh with a small raise and you could even open something like king queen or king queen suited something like that make a little parenthesis there um but pretty much a 10 20 um this is all i'm doing pretty much maybe you raise fives from the button it's just an estimate and again i'd be limping uh, every pocket pair that's below the minimum pair that I would raise because set mining in the first two levels, especially at low stakes hit and goes, it's like, it's like printing money. As long as you don't get out of hand, a really good thing uh, to note is to not call more than say a hundred chips at the 10, 20 level to flop a set. Um, uh, cause you want 15 to one implied odds on your money or no more than maybe 90 or 100 chips at the 1530 level as well. All right, and at the 1530 level, I'm probably raising uh, pretty much the same range, except maybe I'll loosen up a little bit. So maybe on the button, I might raise with a seven suited just because the blinds are a tad bit higher, or I might come in with like king jack suited or something like that. But again, it's just a guideline. Um, you wanna do what feels right for you, what makes you feel comfortable playing post flop, but at the same time, not being too loose because the biggest thing is to know that we should be super, super nitty um, because all the money comes from the end game. All right, um, and so now I wanna dive into uh, some over pairs and three bet situations. Um, and the first hand that I have for you right here, this one, I, I, I love this hand and I hope you guys will find this very entertaining. Um, it's, a, it's a common spot that people get confused about. They don't know if uh, they should be, it's gonna fold, he's gonna fold. Um, it's going to be folded to us and do we three bet or do we flat call? Like, what do we do? And uh, usually my three bet range, I'll write this down for you. Um, and it's it's like this with most regulars. Um, our three bet range is pretty much like queens and up and then ace king. It doesn't mean you always three bet ace king. Like, I think personally I flat ace king preflop more likely than I would re-raise. But it depends on a lot of situations. Like maybe you know that the person who raised in front of you is really, really, really loose. And so then Ace King seems like it's better to, to three bet. Maybe the guy raises from the button and you have Ace King. It seems better to three bet. But then sometimes uh, when you're unsure or maybe the guy's a tight raiser, uh, flatting would be the best option. And this is the same, same with Jax here. Jax is kind of equivalent to Ace King in a way because it seems on the border you guys probably know what i mean where it seems like on the border of being good enough to re-raise but then not being good enough to re-raise because queens always feels like yes i should re-raise here and Jax is kind of like uh it's iffy um so i can go both ways in in this one I, I decided uh to flat call and so obviously when this flop comes out uh we're just gonna check because it's likely to hit a lot of his range um so he checks behind and the turns a king and now when the when the board pairs uh the top card it makes it more likely that our hand is is best here um uh, maybe he has something like ace queen that's definitely plausible um but i'm just gonna i'm just gonna check again and i think he bets 60 here uh and i'm not certain that i have the best hand at this point but calling 60 into 180 is four to one here and you can see on the on this program it'll give you the little odds up here uh, for four to one and just 60 chips we we can't fold um, so I decided to call and then the river is obviously the best card in the world and it's not like we're chasing a jack it's because we thought we had the best hand and at this point um, sometimes you can check and and go for a check raise I guess a lot of people do that because they've been checking the whole way down I I personally I, I just like betting out for value here because you might get a hand like ace queen to call um, or a weaker pair maybe. Um, so I bet two thirds the pot and he raises the six. And the moment that a player raises like this on the river, especially in a low stakes sit and go, they always have a huge hand. It's not necessarily like he has the stone cold nuts. Like he has quad Kings. Oh my God. He has quad, you know, uh, OMG quad Kings. <laughs> it, it's just that he has a hand that is, uh, we could call it nut worthy. Like maybe he has ace 10 of diamonds for the nut flush. It's not necessarily the nuts, but it's kind of the nuts. It's nut worthy. Or maybe he has pocket queens for a boat. 
or or he has a slow played ace king which is less likely because ace king will probably bet the flop but when a player makes this type of raise in a sit and go you can 99.9 percent .9 always assume that they have a monster hand but now we have a monster hand too and so his monster hand could be any type of king um and it's probably less likely that it's a weak king like a king three because he raised an early position but our hand is too strong um so obviously we're just going to move all in and obviously he's going to call and he turns over boat so we lose but there's nothing we can really do there because if, yes we could have folded on the turn for 60 chips i think it would be a little bit weak but once the river comes we just go broke so that's a fun hand but i think the biggest thing is considering how to play jack's pre-flop in a given situation maybe if the button raise that defends seven maybe we would re-raise him pre-flop because now he's in late position and not early position anyway so that was a that was a cool hand um so the next one here we have uh pocket kings okay so we get a limper and here's how i i size my raises at the 10 20 level and i'll write that down for you mm -hmm. let's see Bet size, I think four times the big blind plus one big blind per limp. So I would make it 80. And then I would add 20 for this limper right here. And I'd make it 100. All right. So then he calls. And usually limp calling is not a good idea unless you have uh, a pocket pair. So deuces through nines would probably be my range here. But I'd probably raise eights or nines from this position. So maybe like deuces through sevens. If I were this guy... I have deuces through sevens. Okay, so the flop comes nine six three, and obviously we're going to make a continuation bet. I, it's more of a value bet, I guess. Um, and I like to go like not exactly half pot, but I like to go a little above half pot, maybe two thirds of the pot, something around like one forty or one fifty, something like that. Uh, so I, I lead out one forty, um, which is completely standard because we have a good hand on this board. All right, he calls. Okay. Um, and the turn brings an eight, and obviously we're gonna fire again, maybe something like two thirds or three fourths the pot. Um, it's unlikely a straight got there because it, it's, it would be like a gut shot straight. It's likely he has a nine for a top pair. Um, so we're just gonna lead out again for value, and he moves all in. Now, if it was me who was playing against you, since my range preflop was deuces, deuces through sevens, um, for the way that for the line that he took pre-flop and if I took now this line on the turn I would have a set of sixes or a set of threes pretty much every single time um, But against an unknown in a low stake sit and go we're never gonna fold our over pair So don't get caught up in thinking maybe he has a set um, He could but most likely not if he's just a random player So obviously we're gonna call every time and he turns over top pair and cool We take it down and we double up early on so what did this guy do wrong? Um, well, he limped with Jack nine preflop. Um, then he called the raise, and then he called the flop, and then he moved all in on turn. So basically, he played the hand about as bad as you could possibly play it. But from his point of view, it's just stupid Joker star setup where he flops top pair and a guy's an over pair like what a cooler. Um, and that's why these games will always be profitable. Excellent. Doubling up early on. Uh, so this next hand... Uh, we got jacks. Okay, we get some limpers. So unlike the first time when there was a raise and we flat called, now we're going to make it four times the big blind plus two limps. And so that's going to be 120. Okay, let's see what happens. So we get a call. Uh, the flop comes king, three, eight. A lot of people make the mistake. And I actually, I made this mistake earlier today while I was playing. <laughs> um, a lot of people make the mistake of checking and shutting down here because the king came off. Or or if it's ace, eight, three, they, they shut down. Um, it's really important in these spots, um, since you're fairly deep stacked, I guess you could say. I mean, nothing like a cash game, but you're fairly deep stacked for a sit and go. Um, to make sure that you continuation bet here, um, one for information and two for for value. Uh, so I bet maybe something like 160 or 180. Uh, and the reason is, is that if he, he has a lot of hands that are unpaired that he's holding, where if we check and he checks behind... We give him a chance to catch up with an ace or, or a queen. Um, but if we bet now with the jacks and he calls, then we can shut down on the turn or try and play a very, very small pot and get to showdown if possible. So I probably bet like 160 or 180 here. Okay. 
and he folds. Excellent. But if we check there and the turn comes a queen or an ace, now we're definitely shutting down. But we could just let him get there with a hand like maybe ace queen uh, or ace nine or something like that. Even though it's uh, he only has three outs if he has like a naked ace. But um, I definitely like c-betting there to uh, try and take down the pot right there and define uh, where we are so we don't have any difficult decisions. Okay, this is a, a really interesting hand that I'm actually gonna use this hand as an example uh, for another hand that comes up um, probably towards the end of the video. Um, it's, a, it's a perfect uh, three bet spot um, pre-flop. So he raises under the gun and we're gonna raise to 450, okay? He flat calls. Flop comes nine, deuce, deuce. He shoves. Everybody and their mom would call with pocket queens here. He has king nine. Uh, he shouldn't have re-raised. Uh, I mean, he shouldn't have raised pre-flop. He should have folded. He shouldn't have called the other bet. Um, but again, he probably thinks it's a cooler because got there. But then he gets lucky. Excellent. <laughs> All right. Um, but this hand is going to be important because it's going to come up later. Like, what do we do in this spot if we had ace king? Or what do we do if we have pocket jacks? And so this will come up later and we'll bring that hand back up. All right, uh, the next over pair hand. Oh, whoops, I forgot the uh, the program. I guess it entered this hand twice. Let me go to the next one. Uh, that was the same one. All right. So here we have jacks. Um, there's a raise to 40 and a re-raise to 200. Um, usually right here, I just muck jacks all the time. Even if it's two unknown players, if I had pocket queens right here, I'd probably shove. Um, but there's, even though jacks and queens are, I guess, technically only, you know, queens are only one hand better than jacks, but there's some just, there's a huge gap between the strength of jacks and queens. And it's kind of similar to the difference between ace jack and ace queen. And that's kind of something that you pick up the more you play, you start noticing how jacks will feel like a fold here, uh, but queens feels like a shove. And it's kind of something with like intuition and experience. Um, okay, so just folding pre-flop with jacks. It's doable. All right. Um, and here's the last over pair hand. Um, I raise it to 120. Now at the 1020 level, I would have made it four times plus the limp. Uh, at 1530, I do three times um, plus, plus the limpers. Um, I used to do, I used to do four times a lot where I'd raise to 120 and then and then add 30. And I think that's fine too. But I, I've just, I, I've found that I prefer this, even though a lot of good players would make it 150 here and that's fine. I just, it, it works for me and that's what's important um, is that you find something that works well for you as long as it's not a min raise. <laughs> um, so this is really interesting because actually now that I'm watching this hand back in the replayer, I'm seeing it differently than when it actually happened in the game. Um, and I think that's one of the flaws, like the disadvantages of playing a lot of tables at once, is that sometimes you miss on some pretty straightforward things that if you were playing maybe, you know, five or six tables, you would never miss. And that's that when I was playing, I remember when this hand happened, and I raised to 120, and I thought that this 34 cat, or whatever his name is, I thought that he made a re-raise to 410, and that he wasn't all in. Because obviously, if someone moves all in for 410, they obviously don't need a strong, as strong of a hand as if they were re-raising to 410 with like a normal stack. I thought he was making like, you know, a, a three bet pre-flop. And then I saw that this player, you know, made the four bet all in pre-flop. And I was just like, oh, cause a lot of people say that even against unknowns, like you shouldn't fold here. And I kinda, I kinda disagree, but I kinda agree at the same time. Cause sometimes I'm just like, oh, they always have aces or kings here. Like this, the guy who, one of these guys always has aces or kings. But now that I watch it back and I see that this is just an all in for 410, I would call here every single time. Um, and I ended up folding. And it was really cool that this guy had kings. And so my dumb mistake actually paid off in that moment. But overall, I think that fold will lose me money uh, in the long run. So bad fold, slap myself on the wrist. Don't do that again. All right. Uh, but it's, it's good to show that folding Queens preflop does happen. Cause like, I don't know, there's something about Queens. Like I can't, I can't fold. I can't fold. It's so, it's so nice. All right. 
Uh, so we're going to go to like ace king, ace queen, and c bet type situations now. Um, not that hand, not pocket fours. All right. So ace queen, um, I said that uh, in early position, uh, I would raise jacks and ace queen and probably tens. So like tens and ace queen, we'll call it. And I would go four times the big blind. So 80, boom. All right. So let's see what happens. And we get three bet here to 220. Um, a, a very common mistake that people make uh, is calling this re-raise because ace-queen is just too strong of a hand to fold pre-flop. I'll tell you this right now. I would always fold this pre-flop in this situation. The only time ever in like a sit-and-go like this. Like if this is a cash game, it's a different situation. But let's in, in this sit-and-go, the only way that I may not fold this is if this guy is some complete lagtard who's playing like every single hand and like is crazy. But normally, you're not going to run into a guy who's playing 95% of their hands all the time and like re-raising every single hand. So it's just going to be a fold. So I let it go. And a lot of people call there with ace-queen. And what's funny is, if let's say that the, the person who's re-raising you, let's assume that he has some sort of a decent hand. It's always the most common hand you'll see there is pocket kings because they're re-raising you with you know, like ace king or jacks or queens or aces or kings. But since we have a queen and an ace, it becomes more likely they have kings. And so what happens is I, I can't even count the number of times I've seen this or the number of times I used to do it before I learned to fold. It's like you call the, the three bet with your ace queen. The flop comes queen high. You get it all in because you have top pair, top kicker. And they turn over kings every single time. You're just like, I can't get away from it. It's top pair. But we could have just got away from it pre-flop. So that's a very common mistake that people make, and it's so simple to fix, All right? So three times at the 1530 level plus the limper, 120. So we get a call, and the whole world calls. Um, and a lot of you, I'm not sure. I think a lot of a lot of you uh, may continuation bet this because it's a, it's like a a, a dry board, um, and I would definitely continuation bet this into one person. Let's say that only one person called. Uh, the Well, the pot wouldn't be 420 because one less person. But let's just say it was 420. I'd probably fire like 280 or, you know, like a little more than half pot. Um, and I find like if you if you don't bet exactly half pot, because like a lot of people, even though they may not be good at poker or whatever, they're like, oh, I've heard of Dan Harrington. Harrington, I'll hold him. I know what a continuation bet is. That's half the pot. And so a lot of times if you bet 240, um, I'm not 240, uh, 210 into 420 or something like that like something that's exactly half pot people are like oh that's continuation bet i read that in a book and so what i like to do is i like to take that half pot amount but then increase it by a little bit something like 250 i said 280 i was thinking half was 240 i'm 420 so i'm dyslexic uh <laughs> but something more like a believable number something like 245 or like something that's realistic it's authentic you know and it's more believable but against two people a really 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 good rule of thumb to learn don't continuation bet into more than one opponent in a sit and go maybe in, in a multi-table tournament totally different concept or a cash game but in a sit and go just don't do it um because you're going to find yourself getting in some weird situations um and then also again uh stray away from betting exactly half pot because Everybody saw that in a book somewhere by a guy with a green hat. All right, uh, let's go to the next hand here. Um, oh yeah, so I just I just check fold. Oh, I want to show you this is funny. Um, so check check check. Oh, I'm all in for three times the pot. Yeah, he he must be very good at sitting goes. Um, so here's the next hand. We got a uh, ace king. We get a limper. So I'll make it four times plus the limper. That's a hundred. We get a call. We get a re min raise. Now usually when I see this. Ooh, drinking some Pepsi, it's good. Usually, when this happens, the first thing I see, like in my head, it just goes aces, 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 it's just like flashing in front of my eyes, like all the time. Um, I've seen some people do it with some, you know, really weird hands, I, like, I don't know, sevens or something. But the majority of the time, it's going to be a huge hand. Um, and I guess right here, like where I was advocating folding ace queen pre flop when the guy re raised the 220, if I had ace king in that same spot, I'd probably advocate folding too. Um, but for some reason, I felt very stubborn here, and I decided to call. And I don't think it's horrible, but a fold is perfectly acceptable too because this shows a lot of strength. And this is somewhere where your heads-up display could come in handy because you would see 
oh, whoa, that guy's not raising a lot of hands. He probably has something huge here. So when I'm calling here, I'm calling with caution and I want to take uh, the hand very, very slow. So I call and so does the other player and we flop top pair on what looks to be a very, a very nice board. Um, but we have to keep in mind, we have to ignore that we have top pair, top kicker, and we have to remember the action that happened pre-flop because that should make us wary. Uh, and I'd probably just check here um, to keep the pot small if I can. Okay. Now he bets 120. Now, usually when someone bets this small into the size of a pot, I think they're very weak. And I think that's the case the majority of the time. Um, I've seen some people bet min and then you raise them and they insta re min raise you. And that's some weird play. I, I don't, I don't get that, but that's usually strength. But usually when someone bets really weak here, it's probably cause they are weak. So my, what, the hands that I'm assigning him right now, I'm combining his preflop action with this bet. And I think he was really strong preflop, but now he's really weak post flop. He probably has something like pocket queens strong before weak now. Cause there's a king. So I, I just decide to flat call, um, because I want to I wanna keep the pot small because I feel that uh, I have a vulnerable hand here given the situation, even though I think his hand range is, is weighted to, to queens. So I call, other player calls as well. So pot's 900, and I'll just check again to keep it as small as I can. Now he shoves all in. Now this is really confusing because, wait a minute, I thought he was weak on, on the flop. So maybe you would think, wow, like if he thought he was strong pre-flop, but then he was weak on the flop, but now he's really strong now, like what does he have, like, pocket tens, right? I thought I was strong pre-flop. Now I'm weak on the flop, but now I'm really strong on the turn. And so it's really weird. And I thought it was a really weird line that he took. And so I decided to call and the other player folds and he has aces. So I just, <laughs> my, my suspicions were right. Um, but nonetheless, I don't, I don't mind how I played this. Um, Cause I don't think they always have aces, but the huge majority of the time, but after he bet the weak 120 on the flop. That's what suckered me in. So I guess maybe if you're playing against me, just just bet something really, really weak, and you'll sucker me in. <laughs> I guess may, maybe that's a huge leak of mine. I'm I'm uh, very easy to uh, persuade. All right, let's uh, let's go to the next hand here. Twenty. All right, ace queen. Um, this is a very common spot people mess up on, uh, even if. Oops, there we go. Even if this player was a random person, which he's not because this player is a regular, um, and I know that he's fairly tight. So if he's raising under the gun, we know that he has a huge hand there. Um, see, and he makes it four times, like big deal. Three times, four times, doesn't matter at this blind level, whatever you prefer. I would fold here even if a random person raised, um, just because I prefer uh, folding these types of hands early on. Wow, look at that queen, it looks like massive. Uh, <laughs> But especially against him, I would fold. And even if you had something like ace king, you could consider folding because this, if you know someone's range is super duper tight, and especially if he's under the gun, it makes it even tighter. Sometimes it's okay just to fold. Um, so I just let it go. And I think that's important because a lot of people would flat call there with their, with their ace queen. All right, next hand, ace queen again. Okay, we get a raise under the gun. And just to show you, fold right okay and here's the last one and i know i have aces here but uh it's what the other player has um that's important so if if a good player is sitting right here and say you're this player and this player is a, a, a winning regular uh, you should pretty much fold everything <laughs> besides probably like aces or kings like if you have queens here the best you can do is tie unless you know that that's a regular who re-raises with ace king um so it folds back around to him and he shoves uh and obviously we're gonna call and he turns over ace king so i like his play pre-flop there was a limp so he made it three times plus a limper to 120 but when you get re-raised by by a winning player you should usually just muck ace king pre-flop in this situation um pretty much every time because, like, for me personally, the worst hand that I have there with the line that I took is pocket queens. Um, so I have queens, kings, or aces every single time. Um, maybe ace, king, if this guy was crazy, crazy loose. Uh, which I don't think he was. Actually, now I kind of, I, I recognize his name now. I think that guy multi-tables. Um, so maybe he didn't 
know who I was when this hand happened, but um, maybe he'll learn that he shouldn't do that versus a, versus a winning regular. Um, so I would have just folded pre-flop. Cool. All right. Um, so the next topic um, I'm going to go over is uh, set hunting. And this is really basic, but I think a lot of people uh, get it wrong. And that's 1530 blind level right here. Some people might come in for a raise to 90. I don't mind it. I just limp. And sometimes you would want to look at the people behind you. Um, maybe if these guys were all winning regulars who are playing super tight right now, I just raise because it's more likely we'll just take down the blinds. Maybe these guys were all loose fish, you know, which is pretty normal. So then I, I'll limp because I want to be in a pot with them. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't want to build a pot with pocket sixes um, because I only really want to build a pot if I, if I hit a set. So I'll just keep it small and limp. So obviously we miss. So it's just fold or check whatever option that we have. Okay. Here's the next one. It's the exact same situation. We have a small pocket pair in the cutoff. Um, so we're doing the exact same thing, right? No. The uh, One of the biggest things, and even winning players mess up on this, is that they limp at the 25, uh, 2550 level to flop a set. And that's just bad. Um, so I'm going to write this down. Um, do not limp to flop set at 2550. And this is really important because you start spewing a lot of chips when you do this. Now, there are exceptions. Maybe two people limped in front of me right here. Then I'd come along behind. Um, maybe I've already doubled up to 3,000. Okay, because now losing 50 chips isn't the end of the world. Um, it's not really spewing if, you, if you've already doubled up, although I'd probably still fold. Um, maybe you could even come in for a raise. I know some players who would do that. I usually don't. I'd probably raise maybe like sixes, maybe sixes or sevens, um, something like that. Uh, just, but the big rule is 2550 level set mining is over. All right. And then, uh, last set hunting hand. Okay. So back at 1530. So we get a raise right here. So we're going to call it a flop a set, right? No, no, we're not. Um, and I'll show you why. Uh, you usually want 15 to 1 to flop a set. And I'll write this down. You're 7.5 to 1 to hit your set. So that's like out of every 8.5 times, you're like 12% to flop a set. Whatever. Um, you should have about twice as much as that uh, on your money. And I think I already said this a little bit about I wouldn't call more than like 90 or 100 at this level. I said in the beginning of the video or 100 chips at 10, 20. Um, and it's also really, really important that you look at his stack. So let's say we had 15 to 1. Like we had 15 times his bet. So what is that? It's like 1,800. Let's pretend we had 1,800 chips and we're like, oh, I heard I heard in that video we can call if we have 15 to 1. But in this spot, you have to look at the original Razor's stack. Because um, you have to remember when you set mine, you want your opponent to have aces. You want them to go broke, you know, because like aces is like, God's gift to poker, you know. Uh, but right here, he only started the hand with, we'll just call it 1,200. So really, if you're calling, you're like 10 to 1. So it would be a bad call, even if you had your stack was 15 times his bet. So it's really important to look at that initial stack. Um, so like, if he raised a 90 here, uh, then it's closer because he's, he's probably like, 12, 13, something like that uh, on your money. Um, so even that's close. It's funny because now I'm thinking, like, I, I'd always call 90, and I think even calling 90 isn't 15 to 1 because of his stack's kind of small. All right. Um, let's see. And I couldn't find a hand where I actually flop a set because I never flop a set. Like, what's going on? Uh, a, a general rule of thumb just, like, for playing a set uh, that I like, um, like to keep it simple, um, you know, because you could get a little more complex and – depending on board texture and position and how, how many people and yada, 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 and all that stuff, you know. Um, but generally, if there's a raise pre-flop, I'll go for a check raise because the raiser is more likely to continuation bet, especially if it's against one opponent. Um, sometimes you can smooth call your set, ch like check call and smooth, uh, slow play. I don't even like slow playing that much, but sometimes like on a dry board, if you think, like say the board is like nine, three deuce and you have pocket deuces. If the guy is ace king and he continuation bets, 
if you raise, he's going to fold. But if he has an overpair, even if he smooth call, he's probably just going to go broke on the turn anyway. So that's a good thing to think about. All right. Let's go to this. This is uh, the next category is playing top pair weak kicker. And I'm sure a lot of the time you go, oh, crap, I flopped top pair. Like, what do I do, man? What do I do? Classic example, right? Checked around. Oh, like they could easily have like king 10, king jack. And something like king 9 suited here. I mean, this isn't extremely weak for a kicker. It's like top pair medium kicker. But what I like to do in these spots, like when I have a kind of a good hand, like if I had king deuce, I'm more likely to check because like I'll just fold to a bet unless it's like a really, really small bet. Uh, but king 9 has some value. So I'm just going to take a small little stab at the pot, see where I'm at. 60. Cool. Let's see what happens around us because even if we lose 60, it's no big deal. So we get a call. And obviously, we're going to check when the ace falls. I, I think everybody probably does that unless we're playing some meta game or something. <laughs> um, and now when the five rolls off, uh, there could be some value in betting, maybe like 90. You might get them to call with a weaker hand or you could check call a small bet. Um, what I do here, I think either one is acceptable. I check. Yeah, I'd call this 90. Oops, what's he got? Oh, there you go. Second nut, something like that. Uh, so we uh, we check called valued for him, I guess. But I think it's fine there because um, a lot of guys will will tend to bet weaker hands there. Um, but folding is fine too. But I I'd, I'd call it again if I was in that situation. So I'm fine with it. But the point is, is that we're not building a big pot with top pair. Like, even if the turn wasn't an A, say it was a deuce, like, if I were to bet, I would bet small again, because I'm not betting like, oh, I got to put, I got to put chips in this pot, get some value out of this. I'm, my train of thought is, keep the pot small, if there's resistance, get out of the way. But in the meantime, with no resistance, take that small pot and just try and, try and get a little bit of value. Um, so that's my thought process. Um, and so here's the other top pair. This is top pair, very weak kicker. This happens all the time. Like, yay what a crappy hand i have every card on the turn is bad like you know i have nothing right now um so unlike the king's hand like i i, I tend to check here because it's weak it's like a really weak hand but actually i think even betting something like 45 or or 60 or you know something like that um can be fine um so i decided to check and i'd probably call like you know if someone bets 60 there, maybe I'll call and peel a turn card and just try and play a small pot. Um, now that I have a best hand here, and I think, and I want to also add, like, this is a situation that's, uh, we're, we're very deep stacked, and it's a small pot. I mean, this is kind of a very cash game style type hand. I mean, in a cash game, you might try to win the pot more often than in a sit and go, because in a cash game, you get the money right away. But here, if you win the 90 chips, like, hey, big whoop, I got 90 chips. That does almost nothing. Um for the grand scheme of things for this game. Um, but I think there's a lot of different acceptable ways to play this type of hand. Maybe you could, you know, bet out on the flop or, you know, or check call or check fold. Like it's just remembering like the progression of sit and goes like this hand really doesn't matter. So here though, that it was checked around, I'm just going to take a stab at 60. So we get a call and probably just going to shut down on the river and maybe check all small bet. So obviously that's, I mean, we're just going to check fold here. Um, but then he bets 30. So look up here, eight to one. We can't fold for 30, even though the whole world, like every hand he could possibly have beats us, but it's so cheap. We're going to call. And wow, I thought I lost this hand. He had jack four. So what did this guy do? He, yay, yeah, he limped in early position with jack four suited because it was suited. Sweet. All right. Um, so now I'm going to switch to just some very, very common mistakes that people make that are super easy to fix. Like king queen suited. Oh, everybody plays that hand. Um, here's a raise. I think that 80% of people who play low stakes sit and goes would call this. Maybe even more than that. I fold it every single time. So that's a very common thing. And now if this player limped instead of raised, you could probably limp behind there. Um, I don't do it all the time, but I've seen some really good players do it and I'm starting to incorporate it a lot more. Um, so I said earlier, limp deuces through nines. Um, limping behind someone, uh, and this is for like 10, 20, and 15, 30, you could probably limp. I, and I don't do this as much. Like I don't limp with queen jack suited.
but I've seen a lot of good people do it. So I think it's I think it's okay to do. Um, maybe stuff like queen jack suited, king queen suited. I've even seen good players limp with like, you know, queen ten suited. Uh, I don't do it, um, but if they do it, I'm sure it's okay because hey, they're winning money somehow, right? Um, but then again, the moral of this is this isn't going to bring you tons of money because all the all the money comes from the end game. Our goal in the early game is to A, build our stack with our big hands, or B, preserve our stack for push fold uh, later in the game. Um, and even like if a bunch of people limp, then you could even limp with like speculative hands. Like you could probably limp with like 9-8 you know, suited or like jack-9 suited, like if there were like four limpers. I mean, why not? It's going to be a multi-way pod and people are, God, people are just so bad. Like they'll stack off so light. Um, it's not something, it's not like I'm, if this mal a guy limps that i'm limping behind with jack nine suited that would just be a situational spot where like oh look like the whole table is in it's a family pot all right i'll get him for 20 chips with a marginal but potentially good hand um so another easy spot that's easy to fix same thing a lot of people will call here or they would raise um fold just fold and it seems kind of straightforward but for a lot of people it's a standard limp or, or it's a standard raise um and so it's a really easy thing to fix. Um, I think this is one of the biggest mistakes people make is they'll they'll raise here because it's ace jack. Um, I see people limp, but it's mostly people raise um, because it's like an ace with a face card. For some reason, a lot of people think that like ace 10 is a limping hand and ace jack is a raising hand. I have no idea why. <laughs> um, but for me, it's, uh, it's just a fold. Even if this guy folded, I would just fold it. Um, and that's like what I said earlier about in early position, raising like tens and ace queen. All right. So the next one, even though it's 1530 and we're one seat more over, folding's fine. And maybe if I was in this seat or this seat, I might come in for a raise to 90. Uh, but in early position, it's just going to be a fold. All right. And so now um, we're back at that queen's hand from earlier. Uh well, I guess maybe we should bring that up later. Wait, we have one more hand here. Then I'll go back to that queen's hand, sorry. Um, so this is a good transition to 2550. Um, oops, well, uh, I gave it away. Um, if it folded to us, I would definitely come in for a raise uh, to 150, and I wanna write that down. How I determine my my raise at 2550. Um, actually, and same thing as above, so I'll just do a little carrot top thing. And actually, lately I've been doing 2.5 times the big blind, um, just because like, I've been experimenting with it, um, but I still think that uh, three times plus the limp is the best. Now, the 2550 level is like, oh man, this is the level that like really pisses me off the most. Because it, it, like, how, how many times have you found yourself like, let's pretend this Pepinos, which by the way, I don't know if you've ever seen him before, but he's got the fish avatar from Little Mermaid, so I'm just, I'm just, I'm just saying. Anyway. But let's say that he limped right here for uh, for 50. How many times have you found yourself going, oh, well, I have, I have a good hand here. I'm going to raise three times plus a limp to 200. And then he calls, and then the pot is 475, because like you, you include the blinds in his call. It's 475, and he checks. You're like, oh, I have to continuation bet. And then you bet like 250 or 300, and he moves all in. You're like, but, oh, like you dwindles yourself down to like eight or 900, and you're just like, oh, man, this sucks, you know? And that's why I don't like this blind level is because it's like it's there's really weird stack setups. And so there's ways to get around those weirdness, uh, like th those weird post flop situations when your stack size compared to the pot in your opponent's stack is like really, really weird. Um, and usually the solution to that is doing a lot of really like unorthodox overshoves. So like right here, I would fold nines like all the time. But let's say that guy was like some crazy loose razor guy, which this player isn't because um, I played with him a bit. But let's say he was. You could consider just reshoving here for like, what is that, like eight and a half times his bet? Something like that. Eight times? I don't know. Um, and it seems weird. It's like, dude, like, why are you putting in so many chips like that? But it's the way to get around the awkwardness of the stack setup. Um, because if you made a normal raise to 450, which I, I would not do with this hand. That's something I would do like with that pocket queens hand earlier. Like if I raised the 450 here, I, I'd have queens, kings, and aces. Um, and something like aces, or um, ace, king, and jacks, I would just shove 
to get around the weirdness of the stack setup. And maybe something like pocket tens I'd shove too. Um, and then nines I tend to fold all the time, unless for some reason I knew that he was some like a razor who went really, really wide. Um, and so that's like uh, this ace king hand. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where's this ace king hand? Come on. Do 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 do. Mm, where is my ace king hand? Great. Disappeared. Okay, well, even if I can't find it, um just it's it's kinda like that nines hand where I would just uh I, I'd shove over the top to avoid the awkwardness. I was trying to find the example, but I have all of the hands down here because it's all jumbled up and I had it all like mapped out on my piece of paper here, <clears throat> but I couldn't find it. So, oh well, um, but the point is, is that shoving the ace king is works better versus that hand with uh, pocket queens where we just raised uh, three times the big blind because we had, we had a good hand that we knew that, that we were gonna be getting in on the flop because most flops are gonna be good for us. But if we re-raise there with ace, ace king, most flops will not be good for us. Um, and so we're stuck in a really awkward situation. Um, and so like for, I wanted to, to jot down some things about the opening ranges at 2550, because unlike the 1020 and the 1530 level, um, where it's kinda, I don't wanna say it's mapped out, but in a way I, I, I guess it kinda is. Um, at a 2550, you can open up a little bit and now you can start, you know, raising kind of like those hands that kind of have like sex appeal. I like to call it, you know, like, like, Ooh, look at like King nine suited. Look at that type of hand. Um, usually, and, and that would be like in late position. So say for example, um, it folded around to you here and you knew that actually, I know that this guy is pretty tight cause he was playing a lot of tables when I played with him. So, and let's say you knew one of these other guys was tight. You're like, well, you know what? At 2550 level, that's when there starts becoming a little bit of value in stealing the blind. So you might open up a little and be like, you know what, they're tight. I think my hand has value and there's a chance that I could take down the blinds here. Like I'm gonna raise it up with king nine suited. And then and then if, if you were called, I would just take like the standard continuation bet approach. And uh, if there was resistance, I'd just get out of the way. Um, so like an early position, I would still stick to like being really tight in early position. Um, maybe like open a little more. I think at the 2550 level, like under the gun, you could probably raise like nines and maybe, I still tend to fold ace jack. Uh, so I'm gonna say ace queen, like nines and ace queen. Um, and then, you know, if you move a couple seats over, you probably raise with eights. And here's the point in the game where if you're playing like a non-turbo, there might be five or six people at this point in the game, but if you're playing a turbo, there might be still a full table. So that also, I would take consideration uh, uh, it, like consider that too um because if you're playing five hand and maybe we can raise ace 10 under the gun or something but generally for like right now these ranges i'm giving you are probably like it's going to be like seven eight or nine handed uh, when these spots come up um or like those crazy games when you like cash and it's like 25 50 and you're like what because some dude like sucked out on like everybody at the table and you're like thanks man and then he sucks out on you and you're like ah you donk uh <laughs> but so like in middle position here maybe you can open up like sevens and ace jack um maybe uh ace 10 suited maybe even ace 10 offsuit um this is just I'm, I'm, I'm just guessing here um what seems right there's some players who even open up wider and they'll start including those kind of middle high cards with value like 10 jack suited uh queen jack um and there's actually there's one really good player i've seen uh who even at a full table uh i i saw raise with uh Queen Jack suited under the gun. And I was like, like, what, what in the world are you doing? But he's very successful. Um, and obviously, I mean, I said it before, like if some, if you see someone who you respect and you know that they're really good and you see them do something, even if it's weird for you, you're like, oh wow, like I would never do that. Like consider it, you know, and think about like, maybe should I incorporate that into what I'm doing? Cause obviously it's something that works if they're doing it. Um, and as we move towards like later position, like the cutoff uh, or the hijack or something like that, um, and we'll just call that LP for late position. Um, I'd start opening up um, even more, like so like those king nine suited hands, um, 
queen 10 suited. I'm just jotting stuff down. Kind of stuff like that. Um, when you're on the button, um, maybe you can raise like a suited ace. And I don't necessarily do this all the time. Like a lot of the time I just find myself folding ace three suited. Like if it if I was this guy and it, even if I wasn't doubled up and it just folded around to me uh, on the button, like I find myself folding that a lot. But it's definitely something to consider. Maybe you can even raise deuces here. I probably raise like ace seven suited in like pocket fives or something like that. But even looser is okay. Um, and actually from the uh, from the small blind and oh and one more thing like you want to consider the people behind you like so if you have a heads up display that's really good too because you don't want to raise a speculative hand if there's really really loose callers behind you especially if they're like aggressive um, like if you're playing against someone who's like sees 50% of flops but like never raises then they're weak passive they're gonna call you all the time but they're gonna fold to your C bet like all day so those are people I wouldn't mind raising into because I'm just going to get a lot of value out of them because they're going to check fold so often. But if they're like loose and aggressive, oh yeah, like stay out of the way, you know, because um, then your C-bets are less likely to work. Um, and then when you're in the small blind, when if I know that the player is tight, like when I was playing, I, my heads up display said after like 20 hands, he would played like two of them or something and hadn't come in for a raise. I like to raise to 150 and just take down the chips. And I don't, I don't think of it as 50 chips. I think it was 75 because of my 25 that was here. But I don't really like making this play against a random person where my HUD says, oh, yeah, you have, you know, 20 hands on him. He's kind of tight. I, I prefer it if I know uh, for sure that the player is playing a bunch of tables or, like, they're really tight, like a tight regular. Because if I was here and you were this player, you could probably raise, and I might muck, like, ace-9 or ace-10 and just go, like, I don't care. It's early on. I'll get you later, you know. And so, like, that's why I prefer making this against uh, a regular who I know is very good because they're going to be super tight. Um, tighter than even, like, a tight fish um, because they understand, regulars understand that you're supposed to be very tight uh, at this phase of the game. All right. And I think that was, uh, that was the last hand, yeah. So... If you guys uh, have any questions uh, or there's or uh, like a topic that didn't come up or you want me to go more in depth about about something, um, let me know. Um, yeah, as I, I I'm really excited about doing all these videos because I want to I want to share uh, my knowledge with you guys so you guys can start making some monies and uh, start buying some really cool things, you know. All right. Um, so that's it. Just post your uh, questions in the forum. Let me know. All right, guys. Good luck in the long run. Take it easy.